...surged across Israel's borders this weekend in an eruption of violence that left more than a dozen people dead. The Arab Spring has come to Israel's borders. And someday soon, we may look back at the region's 50 years of conflict as the good old days. That's what our next guest believes. Michael Scheuer launched the bin Laden unit within the CIA and is an expert in Islamic terror movements. Michael, welcome. Thank you, sir. Michael, you see this past weekend and the violence along Israel's borders as a <laughs> premonition of what's going to be coming in the weeks and months ahead. Explain that to us. Well, the United States uh, had a strategic policy in the Middle East that for 35 years was based on the maintenance of tyranny. That tyranny allowed us access to oil, it helped to protect Israel, and it allowed the tyrants to persecute, prosecute, and incarcerate Islamic militancy. We have been, oddly enough, uh, uh, Mr. Obama has been, with Mrs. Clinton, been cheerleading the destruction of that, of that uh, strategic policy, which I believe was wrong from the start, but nonetheless, it was our policy, and they've gotten off of one horse without another horse to get onto. And so access to oil becomes chancy. Certainly, Israel's security has been shattered in the last decade in terms of its external shields. And of course, uh, all of the revolutions we've seen so far have released thousands of Islamist militants from prisons in Egypt and Tunisia and elsewhere. Michael, look, there's absolutely no question the contract, as it were, between the United States and the tyrants, and I think most of us would agree with that word, who had dominated Egypt or even Tunisia or certainly Libya and Syria, that contract has broken down. It has run its course. Where I want to challenge you, though, is your harsh criticism of President Obama and Secretary Clinton, because I would ask you, what was the alternative they had? Maintaining that relationship with the Mubarak, with Gaddafi, with Assad, certainly is no longer possible. So is it not better to try to join forces with the movement in favor of democracy and freedom that is sweeping North Africa than to be a firewall in support of tyranny? I don't think you should have supported tyranny. I didn't say that at all. I'm glad that they're gone. I think it's a benefit in the long run for America. But we could have kept our mouths shut. We, we tend to think that Muslims are stupid people that they're going to forget that the United States supported tyranny for, for 35 years. We also have become, at least in our political elite, almost Marxist-Leninists in our belief that democracy is the answer to everything and that it's going to take hold everywhere. And what we've created since Runnymede here in North America and England is going to be recreated in the Muslim world in 18 days. I just don't think it's, it's becoming uh, a president or a secretary of state or the war boys, Senator McCain and Senator Graham, to be arguing somehow that, that democracy is uh, afoot. <laughs> Uh, well, look, when clearly it's not. Well, look, Michael, I, I, first I have to disagree with your premise in terms of the overarching view of the Islamic world. And I think there is much greater nuance in the relationship that the president and the secretary of state and the United States senators, whom you mentioned, are trying to craft with the new leadership. Everybody understands, do they not, that this is a moment of transition. This is a moment where the old ideologies, the old governing structures throughout North Africa and the Middle East are being pushed aside by what is a genuine uprising from the grassroots of the populace. Nobody knows with any certainty where it will go. And I think if you listen to the Fareed Zakarias, the Fuad Ajamis, the real experts in the region, they all say with e there is enormous uncertainty, but certainly it is better to begin to forge the relationship in terms of the common notions of tolerance, freedom, secular democracy that we believe in, not believing it will take root overnight, but certainly to articulate those views than to be a hands-off and let tyranny reestablish itself. Wouldn't you agree with that? No, I wouldn't. I think Mr. Zakaria and, and Mr. Ajami know about as much about what's going on there as, as my chair do, does. Uh, they, they don't like the idea of Islamist governments, and so naturally their analysis is going to be that they're not happening. Just like Mrs. Clinton, just like uh, uh, Senator Graham, just like the president. You, you, CNN and BBC interviewed a few score Muslims in Tahrir Square most all of whom were English speaking, most were clean cut, most were professionals, and they talked the talk of democracy. Then they read a few Facebooks and a few Twitters, and they extrapolated that sample to 85 million Muslims, half of whom or more are illiterate. So the West has really got a skewed idea of what's happening in that country. Well, well, and across the region, sir. It's well, just. It's Look, madness. M Michael, with all due deference to your deep expertise in the region, you have I many years... I didn't claim I had deep deference, sir. What I'm claiming is 
that uh, 85 million Muslims are not going to, to go in the direction of a, of a democracy they consider irreligious or perhaps even pagan, rather than toward 1,400 well, well, years well, of tradition. Michael, l l let's agree with, on something. First of all, I think Fareed and Fouad, Fareed Zakaria, Fouad Ajami are enormously uh, expert, knowledgeable individuals about the region in particular. And the one thing I would say is that nobody thinks Jeffersonian democracy is going to spring up overnight, that somehow the, the, the Bill of Rights that, we, that we, is enshrined in our Constitution will be embraced by 85 million Egyptians. Nobody obviously believes that. But what You we weren't do listening to CNN then, sir, during the Tahrir well, Square business. Well, well, again, Michael, with all deference, I think I, I was listening to it. I was often here. But, but I think here's the larger point. What we are saying is that there is an arc of history and that there is movement in a particular direction. And while we don't have any illusions about where we'll end up, and we all understand Iran and what has happened in Afghanistan time and time again, what we are saying is that positioning our foreign policy no longer behind the tyrants, but in front of the popular movement in favor of those ideals that George W. Bush articulated in terms of democracy, that seems to make sense. I'll give you the last couple seconds. You obviously think I'm wrong. Tell me why. I, I think Bush was wrong. I think Clinton was wrong. I think this guy is wrong. I, 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 it's just not going to happen in the way you think it's going to happen, sir. If it, and even if it did, if, if we had democracy from Mauritania to Jordan, the, the, what, those governments would have to reflect popular um, uh, opinion. And what you would have is the greatest anti-Israeli movement that you've ever seen in your life, because Israel is hated more than anything in the Islamic world. In Look, many ways... Mike, Michael? Look, yes, sir? T time runs short. You, you're going in a different direction of the conversation about Israel. Whole different set of issues. I look forward to having that conversation with you in a couple days. Clearly, it's a paramount issue we've got to deal with. Michael Shorter, thanks for joining us. We will have that conversation down the road.